I was having a series of lectures uh, to stand up to the current uh, fabrication and accusations against Islam and Muslims and Sharia law. Uh, so I just wanted to take the opportunity, uh, especially that the topic was proposed by the sisters, to change the topic a little bit to give the sisters a weapon that they need to speak for all of us, Muslim men and Muslim women, which is the topic of the fabrications and the accusations that they claim that Islam uh, belittles the status of women or Islam is dis discriminates against women and Sharia law and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, when they claim that, hey, you want to impose Sharia law upon uh, Christians and Jews in America, uh, it's actually two accusations in one. The first accusation is, well, you're talking about Sharia law as if Sharia law is something wrong or something bad. The second thing is that we want to impose it upon you. And of course, it's so insanely laughable that Americans, uh, uh, you know, the population is about 320 million, we're not even 9 million. That meaning that we're not even 3% of the population, and they claim in a democracy that we are to impose a certain law upon them. That's the first level of insanity. The second thing is that, subhanAllah, Sharia law is the best thing and one of the best uh, blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon humanity, specifically Muslims, which is simply the guidance, the do's and don'ts, with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the limited comprehension of men. Uh, it is suffice to say that uh, the, the, the Pope of the Vatican, Pope Benedict, uh, was not even uh, one of the friendly ones towards Muslims. He keeps sending requests of dialogue to uh, Sheikh Al-Azhar and Sheikh Al-Azhar knowing his positions would not even answer his calls. The Pope, Pope Benedict, announced in 2009 that I gave my directives to the Vatican Bank to use Islamic law, Sharia law, investment guidelines in our investments because Islamic investments were the only investments in the world that did not collapse in value in the financial collapse in 2008. So the Pope of the Vatican, when it comes to his money, he's saying, when it comes to my money, protect me with Sharia law. And subhanAllah, they talk about Sharia law as if it's something bad. So inshallah, the topic, and I want all the sisters inshallah to listen. If they have any question, uh, hopefully we have distributed some pieces of paper that they can write any question they want, unanimously, and just present it to us, and inshallah will answer it. Uh, it is about women rights in Islam. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة. One of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa taala is that from amongst yourselves He created spouses, men and women, husbands and wives that would be like spiritual homes to each other, and created love and empathy and peace between both parties. The key to the rights of women in Islam is to understand the relationship between women and men. In the West, in the man-made culture, in the man-made law culture, it is a competitive relationship. Equality is that men and women compete at the same level with total disregard of each one's natural abilities and each one of uh, uh, emotional structure as if there are roommates that are splitting some bill somewhere or as if they are business partners that are in competition with each other. With each other. And that, that's why when you look at the relationship between men and women in the best form that it could possibly be, uh, it's marriage. Uh, about 40% and some studies would say 50% of all the relationships end up with marriage, meaning that half of the relationships never end up with marriage. And these marriages, in less than four years, half of them end up with divorce. So only 20 to 25 percent of the relationships are what do you call a successful marriage? 75 percent are not. Imagine 75 percent of the population in a disarray when it comes to their emotional settlement. But subhanAllah, when we go to Islam, Islam, the relationship is that they complement each other. They're not in competition. A woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her the natural abilities of love and kindness and patience over the children. And we are all, men and women, were children before. No one can do that job 
better than the blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon humanity that is called the mother. At the same time, woman cannot have the perseverance and the strength and the protection and uh, going out there and, 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 and having the strength to go and, and earn a living and protect the family and protect the interests like what the man is naturally is capable of doing. To have humanity prosper, to have humanity grow, you have to have both elements. But both elements almost in opposition of each other. You cannot be that strong and that protective and that, you know, going out there to hunt for the family. And at the same time, you are kind and loving and patient with, with, with children. It's impossible. You need both elements and they need to complement each other. And the more clarified and more clear the difference between the man and woman, the more a woman would enjoy herself and a man would enjoy himself and the more they need each other to complete each other and complement each other. However, in Islamic law, and this is of the decency of Islamic law, and it is because it's the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is that the woman is tasked with the best and most noble job in the history of humanity. Some people who are supposed to be feminists would tell you that, you know what, women deserve more right. Why? Because they are half of the society. Which is true. But the Islamic position is even higher than that. They're not half of the society. They are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trusted. The shaping of the character and the upbringing of the entire humanity. Everyone knows it is our mothers who taught us right from wrong. It is our mothers who taught us who our creator was. It was my mother who taught me my religion, what to do, shaped my character and made me the man I was. My father, God bless his soul and her soul, were great, subhanAllah, in, in, in the religion, but he was out there making a living, providing for us. It was my mother who was highly educated and chose to stay home to raise me and my brother. And I owe everything that I'm at, if I'm at anything, to one human being, that is my mother and then my father. And that's why when a man came to Prophet Muhammad and asked, and asked him, Man nasi bi Who is more deserving of my companionship? Prophet Muhammad said, your mother. Which was logical to the man, obviously. And then the man asked Prophet Muhammad then who? He said, your mother. And then the man asked Prophet Muhammad again, then who? He said, your mother. The third time. And then the man asked Prophet Muhammad again, then who? He said, your father. The man in that case did not even get the bronze. That's how elevated the status of a, a, of a woman and you know our mothers in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. You can never find that in any other philosophy in the world. Another example of that greatness, of that most noble job that our mothers and our sisters do. When Jahima came to Prophet Muhammad he was about 14 years old, and Jahima knew the tremendous reward of Shahada. When you go out there and fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Muslim army, and then you have your Shahada, you straight to, inshallah, the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's just no better reward. When the Prophet Muhammad said, said, Oh Prophet Allah, give me the permission to go fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the first question of Prophet Muhammad? Did he ask him, are you able to fight? How old are you? Are you good with the sword or the arrow? No. He asked him, do you have a mother? He said, yes. He asked him, go serve her. Go serve her, stay with her, because the paradise that you seek by being a martyr in the Muslim army is underneath the feet of your own mother. Meaning that you serve her, you be her servant, and that is your way to the same paradise that you're looking for. And he sent him for serving his, his, his mother before he sent him to the Muslim army. And the Muslim army at the time of Prophet Muhammad and this is a fact a lot of people do not know, not one single battle that the Prophet Muhammad went to, that he wasn't outnumbered. From Badr to Khaybar, Badr he was outnumbered one to three, and Khaybar he was outnumbered one to seven. The Muslim army was 1500 and that able to fight men in Khaybar were 10,000. So you're in an army that needs way more soldiers than anyone would need. But if you look at the other hadith of Prophet Muhammad when the man came to him and asked him about the best deeds that a Muslim can do, Prophet Muhammad answered him, خَيْرُ الْأَعْمَالِ الصَّلَاةُ لِوَقْتِهَا The best thing that a Muslim or human being can do is to pray on time. We all know that. Prayers is the line between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. 
What is the second thing? Is it jihad? No, the second thing is to do well by parents. And the third thing is jihad. And we've seen from the previous hadith when it comes to parents, which one of the parents is more deserving of the companionship and more at elevated status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the mother three times over the one time of a man. So from that, you would get to the elevated status of a woman. Now, when we talk about Sharia law, when we talk about Islamic law, we need to understand that that was in the middle of 7th century. When you're talking to any European scholar about any subject of science and philosophy and sociology, uh, the, usually the you know, square one or point zero is always the Renaissance after the Dark Ages. Dark Ages in Europe were like subhuman level. It was devastated because the church with their man-made laws and their claim that there's some people that represent God on earth devastated Europe. Right? These dark ages, point zero for the European civilization, were 500 years after the coming of Prophet Muhammad So we see the decency and the civility and the respect of women and the rights that are afforded men and women and children, animals, even cities. 500 years before the dark ages of Europe, you would understand how great the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us is. Till 1882, what does that mean? The end of the 19th century. A woman in England was not considered a legal entity, meaning that she cannot own a property. It has to be in her father's name or her husband's name. And she could not even stand up in court and be considered a being in court till 1882. The first physician, female physician in Europe was Elizabeth Blackwell. She was British. She did not see a worse treatment than, the, than a treatment from her own gender, from British women. So subhanAllah, when you think about it, I'm going to be a doctor, females can come to me, I'm going to cure him, and they don't have to strip naked before a foreign man for the claim that he's a doctor. Now there's a female doctor that is more respective, uh, respecting to women rights. Yet women not only were treated like they were not legal entities, but they were so brainwashed that they're not worthy even to be doctors. And they are the group that gave her the hardest time. Throughout Europe, and since the beginning of recording, you know, the holy uh, scripts, there was a mistranslation, a severe mistranslation, called the original sin, meaning that the first sin that man had created is to be rejected out of paradise into earth because, you know, Adam and Eve disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in their mistranslation, they claimed that it was Eve, our mother Eve, that caused our father Adam peace be upon him, to be deceived by the shaitan, the devil, and eat from the forbidden uh, uh, tree and eat the fruit of the forbidden. That's why we're all on earth and we're, all, we're not in paradise. And for that, it is all to be blamed on women. It is all to be blamed on our mothers, our sisters, our daughters. Throughout the dark ages, some estimates go as far as almost 3 million women that were burned at the stake. Women were considered just a vessel of you know, procreation, just to have new children and, and, and new breed. Other than that, no worth. So anyone claims anything about a woman, she cooks well or she has some herbal knowledge and she cures people, that's the work of the devil. You know, we give you an option. Confess that you worship the devil and we'll kill you for that confession. Or do not confess, so we'll torture you to purify you from worshiping the devil till death. So you die or die. That's exactly what it was, over th almost 3 million women. Look at that at the same time, of the rights that Islam gave our mothers, sisters and children and daughters in the 7th century. And you would know how great these rights, when you look at the fabrications they make. Why is it, before I get into the fabrications, the claims about a women position Islam, they choose that topic. The reason is, is that you cannot have a renaissance, you cannot have a society advanced and develops and prospers without an educated woman, without women having the right status. So the more you attack the strength of women position in Islam, 
the more people sometimes will stay away from that position and not obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to the orders of women. So the more a woman would get naked, take the hijab off and be an object of desire that they sell in these uh, store shops and store fronts, uh, the more a woman does not have the knowledge and the, of, of the do's and don'ts, she doesn't have the decency of her character and Islamic manners, the more spoiled, the worse a mother she could be. And then when she's that naked and she's that ignorant of the halal and haram of Islam, how could she be expected to teach her daughters and her sons, the new generation, the right thing to do and shape them up to be the people who would carry the next generation over. So that is a point of strength of Muslims and that is the point of attack. First claim, you know what? Islam treats women so badly that they are considered half of a man. <clears throat> SubhanAllah asked him, where do you get that from? He said, well the verse of the Quran says, لِلْذَكَرِي مِثْلَ حَظِّ الْمُنْسَيْنِ In inheritance, a daughter would get half of a man. And it is true. Yet, subhanAllah, look at the answer. Have you seen the entire possibility of inheritance of women in the entire inheritance law? There's 34 potential cases of inheritance in Islamic law. There are four cases where a woman inherits half of the man. The rest of the cases, the other 30 cases, the woman either inherits the same more, and there are three cases where she inherits and the man does not inherit at all. So why you focus on these four cases and not focus on the entire 30 cases? You do the math, and math does not lie, a woman potentially inherits the same amount that a man inherits. Is that fair? No, it's not. It's even more for the benefit of women. In Islamic law, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the man the financial responsibility. So every penny that a woman inherits, even though she inherits almost the same like a man, her money is hers and it's only subject to be increased. What do I mean by that? Why she inherits half and her brother inherits double what she gets. Her brother is to pay a dowry. Her brother is to sponsor a family and become a husband and pay for all expenses for a family. She is to receive a dowry. She is to receive a husband that will be totally financially responsible for her. Her money is only to be increased. His money is always subject to be decreased. The obligation also in marriage. The woman could be so rich. She could be a very, uh, uh, has a high income as a, a doctor, engineer, lawyer, whatever it is. Her money is hers. Her husband's money is hers and his. She's not obligated to give one penny into the budget of the household unless she wants to, out of her own free will. If you go to the French law, for example, it obligates women that they have to contribute to the budget of the marriage by law. In Islam, not one penny. And when you look at inheritance law in Islam, and subhanAllah, it's so advanced, it's mind-boggling. And of course, you cannot come to that level of civility and justice in the seventh century unless this is the law from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at inheritance, there are three conditions that determines how much you get out of inheritance. The three conditions has abs have absolutely nothing to do with you're a man or a woman. The first thing is the degree of relativeness, how close a relative you are to the person you inherit him from. And of course, if you're a close relative and you are a female, you would get more than a distant relative that is a male. That is logical. That's number one. Number two, when you go again to the same condition that they always like that, you know, a daughter gets half of her brother in inheritance, I'll give you a scenario. We have a grandfather, we have a father, we have a son and a daughter. The father in the middle passes away. The daughter, even though she's getting half of what her brother gets, she's getting more than the other male that is the grandfather. So he's a male and she's a female. How come she's getting more than him? Here comes the second condition. The second condition is, are you, which generation you belong to? If you belong to a generation that is young, that is about to receive life and has a lot of expenses, versus a generation of the grandfather or the grandmother, then who lived already their life and they have what they have out of their life, then the young generation gets more. The third condition is who's responsible for who? 
And as we said, the financial responsibility is always on the shoulder. For the girl, it's her father, then her husband, and if her husband passes away, it's her son who's financially responsible for her. Her money is hers and subject to only increase any other male around her and she inherits everyone. Even as a grandmother, she inherits his grandchild and gets one-sixth of his money or whatever that he left behind. Having said that, and I hope that it's clear, show me any law in the world that mandates and guarantees inheritance to the girls, to the daughters. They say, you know what, she gets half of the man. And now we know why. Show me in America that if a father, let's say, left the will that I want to leave my money to cats and dogs, that his daughter would get a penny after his passing. Impossible. In Islam, لا وصية في إرث. Even if you wrote a will, the will is nullified and suspended before Islamic law. You have a guaranteed mandated right in your father's money. No other law in the world provides that. So the same people that tell you, oh, she gets half of that brother in their countries, in their laws, you get nothing. And this is the law and the rights that Allah gave to women in the 7th century. Uh, the second uh, uh, fabrication about Muslim women. Uh, they go, uh, actually, two aspects, you know, the, the first one is the verse in the Quran, أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَنُ حَافِظُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَنُ It says that Islam uh, was allowed to enslave women, and Muslim women were allowed to get women slaves, and so on and so forth. And subhanAllah, it couldn't be further from the truth. And what helps is the mistranslations of the words. Uh, I was on an interview on the, uh, one of the Egyptian uh, TV channels, and I specifically talked about this. People take words from the dictionary without understanding the meaning of them. For example, the hadith of Prophet Muhammad at Deen nasiha If I ask everyone around here, what does nasiha mean in Arabic? Anyone knows? In English. Can you translate nasiha for me in English? Nice. No. See, all of you said advice, does not mean that. At the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Nasiha is purity or sincerity. Nasuh al asal meaning that the honey is purified. And when they said it, they meant that, you know what, the deen is how sincere you are in doing what you do for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the deen is sincerity. So when somebody tells someone, give me a nasiha, give me the pure bottom line of advice. And from that, people thought that it means advice. By that I mean, when you say, look at the word malaka, it means malaka owned. Anyone will tell you that, malaka means owned. In the language of Prophet Muhammad it also meant responsible for. Evidence by the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu One who's strong, a man who's strong, is not the one who wrestles people down to the ground, but it is the one who is in control, responsible for his, himself when he gets angry. So what does that mean? The women that you are responsible for. Why there is women that Muslim men are responsible for on top of their wives and the maximum amount and the most extreme situations can be four. Why on top of the four they are allowed to marry more women? What's the story of that? At the time of battles, we win, all the men of the army are defeated. So the women that are left behind, their daughters and their wives, what's to do with them? You're talking about the middle of 7th century, harsh desert, wolves, slave traders, what to do with them? The fact that you defeated their army and their men are responsible for the fact that now they're widowed and in the middle of nowhere with no supporter and no provider, that yes is the responsibility of their men that fought the Muslims first, yet now in Islamic law, they are your responsibility. They are on your land, you're responsible for them. What to do with them? If you left them there, whether they're going to starve to death, devoured by animals, or if they're lucky, they would be enslaved and sold like pieces of furniture. If you bring them with you and just leave them in the Muslim society, how are they going to support themselves and provide for themselves? And everyone around knows that these people are not Muslims, and they are you know, wives and daughters of Muslim enemies that were just defeated. People are not going to treat them the nicest, and 
they're going to be forced to steal and cheat and to, God forbid, prostitution. And they're going to bring a myriad of problems to the Muslim society of no fault of the people there. Then what is the solution? Think of the fostering system nowadays. For whatever circumstances, there is a child that is an orphan and he has no father or mother to support him. What is the civilization of America in 2012 do? He would be offered to foster parents. Parents that would act like his original parents, that would treat him like that, would treat him like a son, almost like a son, till that foster son reaches a certain level where he can be his own man or his own woman, which is the age of 18. Isn't that what happens here? That's exactly what that system does. It allowed responsible Muslim men to be able to provide for these women like if they were their husbands. They have the same living standards, they have the same food and clothes that is provided to the wives, but at the same time, they're not called wives because A, they could be pagans and a Muslim man is not allowed to marry a, a, a Muslim a pagan woman. B, not to force him to accept Islam in that case if they are to be married to them. And C, because it's not fair to the Muslim woman that because her husband was a hero and won the battle, that he would bring another wife to share the inheritance and share the risk of her daughters. They're not, you know, uh, slaves. Their sons or daughters are named after the man who uh, uh, they are responsible with, uh, exactly like if they're uh, husbands and wives. And at the same time, when they give birth to a boy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his law allowed him to make a choice whether you want to stay, become a Muslim, get married, or you can leave and you're on your own if you choose so. Find me, according to the circumstances, a more humane and a better level than that. And most of these women wind up accepting Islam and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the day that their former husbands died and were defeated so they can be introduced to Islam, so they can be blessed with Islam. SubhanAllah. Another shubha about uh, Muslim women, which is the shubha of the hijab. And, and you know, the, um, the laws that if you look at them, all of them are to protect the women. Why the hijab? It is so beautiful. When you look at the famous hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when a man came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and asked him about how would I choose my wife. So how is a woman Islam is pursued for marriage? A woman is pursued for marriage for four reasons. For her beauty, for her money, for her social status or her family's social status, or for her deen. And the deen in the language of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not that she has the label that it's called Muslim. The deen of someone in the language of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam means the character and the manners of Islam of that man or that woman. So her deen means her character, Islamic character. And he said, choose the one with the Islamic character, with the Islamic manners, otherwise you would not be happy. You'll be sorry as if someone just got dust, which is worthless. Why is that important? Look at the decency and the elevated status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for women. Any woman, any sister, and I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me with four daughters. Any woman can be born beautiful or not beautiful. She absolutely has no control over that whatsoever. She is born in the same picture and the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for her. Any woman can be born into a very rich family into money or dirt poor. She has absolutely control, no control of that. A woman can be born into a family of high status, the daughter of the governor, or she can be born the daughter of the janitor. She has absolutely no control of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messages made the only point and the only thing that a man should look at and respect a woman and a woman would be measured against is her own character and her deen. The only one thing that she is responsible and in absolute control of. And it is the woman of the character. So it's not what you look like, it's not how beautiful of an object you are, it's not how desirable at a certain time with cosmetics and fancy things you are. No, it is who you are, not what you look like.
and it's a thing that you are absolutely in control of. And that hijab comes to minimize the, dis the, the, you know, the distractions of whom we really are, your character. It's not your hair or uh, whatever size of, uh, uh, of you know, physical features that you have, it is who you are. And that is the only thing that just your face and your hand, you know, niqab, which is, which is uh, uh, the, the, what, do you, what do you call the burqa or the, the veil on your face, is, is not an obligation, but it is a bliss thing and it's a good thing to do because that eliminates anyone to be fascinated by you if you are beautiful looking or anything like that, but it's up to you. At the same time, when people say, I look at Muslim women, and look at you know uh, what's happening to them and the sandbox of all these accusations that they bring people and they bring you pictures from Afghanistan and Pakistan and tell you look at what happened to women. Subhanallah, Afghanistan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with them, is the third poorest country in the world. For the past half a century, it was occupied by foreign forces. If it wasn't the Russians and now our own country, America, with the George Bush and Cheney's war against Afghanistan, Devastated, you're looking over there, subhanAllah, at poverty, uh, refugee camps, uh, illiteracy, subhanAllah, a horrible picture. And they take that horrible picture and tell you, well, this is Islam. And subhanAllah, one of uh, the people who uh, are famous about attacking Islam, and of course, he gets paid by the extreme right uh, wing in America and in, in Israel uh, by the millions every year just to you know, create that hatred against Muslim Americans. He said, you know what, I was shocked that in one of the refugee camps, refugee camps in Afghanistan, I discovered that many girls were married at the age of 13. And he's saying it like it's a disaster. Well, have you heard about teen pregnancies in the United States of America? Are we breaking news to you? And subhanAllah, what are you talking about? Marriages. A girl that is known that she's married for, to a man, that he's going to be responsible for her, that he's going to be provided for her, that her kids are going to be legitimate kids and she would walk tall in the society she's at. At the same time, subhanAllah, in a galaxy far, far away called the state of Texas, today in 2012, what is the legal age of marriage? Anyone knows? 14. In Delaware, just less than 200 years ago, it was 12. In Kansas and the progressive state of California, if both parents would give consent to the marriage, there's no age limit. So you could be 8 or 9 or 10 or 11, whatever it is, if the parents would give consent legally, there is no limit for marriage. And subhanAllah, a, a crazy person would hit a woman in Afghanistan or uh, through acid, there was this incident that a man uh, threw acid on the face of a girl that refused to ma marry him. Obviously, he's mentally disturbed. They would bring it and make it a cover story and say, you know what, this is how Muslim men treat Muslim women. And this is Sharia law. When I'm talk talking about a mentally disturbed or absolutely insane person, no, this is Sharia law. Where do you get that from? SubhanAllah. The second aspect that I want to talk about also when it comes to the treatment of women, uh, they always like to speak about uh, that Saudi Arabia does not allow uh, women to drive in there. And the first thing that we want to say is that there is absolutely no basis in Islamic law or fiqh or the hadith of Prophet Muhammad that makes this an obligation by any stretch of the imagination. This is purely a local law that people, according to their own culture, sat together and said, we want to do this. And subhanAllah, people talk about it as if, you know, the Saudis are like, you know, evil people from outer space. Everyone who went to Saudi Arabia would tell you, just because you're walking around with your daughter, with your wife, with your sister, subhanAllah, people will make way for you and give you so much respect. There will be sometimes in the Hajj area, you know, lines that are like, you know, half a kilometer long. And just because you come in with your daughter or your, or your wife or your mother, subhanAllah, they will make way for you and treat you with respect. Even sometimes when you make a violation that is punishable or there's a fine for it, the fact that you have your daughter or sister with you, subhanAllah, they just let it slide and let you go. The amount of respect that women get in Saudi Arabia is unprecedented anywhere in the world. 
And subhanAllah, if let's say in Holland, the Netherlands, in Europe of the civilization, if people have the right to sit down and according to their own democracy, that you know what, there's no such a thing as the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to protect us, uh, and the fact that they know the best for them, and their parliament would convene and say, you know what, we'll take a vote, should we allow drugs, marijuana to be sold in supermarkets or not? And the vote would pass. And now it's legal that in Holland, you buy hash and marijuana and all these devastating things that you'd be put in jail in any place in the world, they sell it right out in the supermarket. But they would tell you, hey, the Netherlands, the, Holland, the, the people of Holland, they have the right to determine their own laws. It's a matter of sovereignty. In Canada, long time ago, they allowed that a woman can marry a woman and a man can marry a man. But it's a matter of the sovereignty of the nation of Canada. But doesn't Saudi Arabia have the right to have their share of maybe stupid laws? If we can call it as such. SubhanAllah. Another uh, fabrication accusations they make against Muslims, and this is for men and women, it's not for women only, uh, which is Newt Gingrich, the next Hitler, in my opinion, who has, you know, every time he you know, speaks about against Sharia law and Muslims and, and so on and so forth. I was in an interview in WBAI, the radio station of New York, when they read in the teleprompter that Newt Gingrich said that if you're a Muslim American and you want to work for the American government, you have to denounce Sharia law. And my answer was, if you're a Muslim or non-Muslim, I want to work for the American government, you ought to denounce any relationship with New Cambridge. SubhanAllah. What he says is, well, look at Saudi Arabia, they do not allow Christians to build churches there. SubhanAllah. Saudi Arabia is one country out of 56 Muslim countries. Why you would choose the only country that is the holy sanctuary, and has the holy mosques and the holy shrines of Islam and want to build churches there unless you are looking for a confrontation. Every religion has its sanctuary. The same way there's a Vatican for the Catholics, it's their sanctuary and never ever that anyone had ever heard that Muslims wanted to build mosques in the Vatican or the Jews wanted to build temples there. Why you leave all the 56 Muslim countries that are filled with churches for the past 400 years and go only to Saudi Arabia and you want to build churches there. And they take advantage of the ignorance of the average of the American people that they don't know, you know, what Saudi Arabia to us and so on and so forth and say, oh, look at this. They hate Christians and they hate churches and so on and so forth. Uh, the next fabrication about women rights that, you know what, your prophet married a nine-year-old girl. That is a Sayyidah Aisha. And subhanAllah, every debate I go to, and every time that question comes up, it's their favorite question. How could a prophet of God marry a nine-year-old girl? First of all, I go back to the age marriage. If you want to see this as a negative from Prophet Muhammad then let's look at the founding fathers of this nation. George Washington, all the way up. When they founded this nation, what was the legal age of marriage? Anyone knows? In America, in the 17th century, not the 7th century. Anyone knows? It was, as it is stated in the Old Testament, six years of age. And then close to the 1700s in California was raised to 9 years old, then 10, then in most of the state 12, and nowadays some states 16, 15, 14, around that range. At the time of Prophet Muhammad not even his worst enemies said a word about the age of Aisha or the marriage of Aisha. So not only that that was the norm at the time, and the absolute norm that no one even seen anything wrong with it, that no one complained about it. But on top of that, it was consummated with the consent of both parents. As a matter of fact, it is famous that Prophet was engaged to her and waited three years till Abu Bakr Siddiq came to him and he said, Aren't you forgetting something that you know you need from us? Like it's time now, she's ready to get married. She is mentally capable and physically capable to be a wife. Why aren't you consuming the marriage? And then Prophet Muhammad consummated the marriage. 
On top of the fact that a lot of people also forget that this was in the middle of 7th century. In any rural areas, when they do not record the birth date, it is customary anywhere in the world, anytime, that people always underestimate their ages. So usually boys and girls think that they are 10, 12, while they are 14, 15. All the time, this is a scientific fact. As a matter of fact, if you follow soccer at all, maybe the men would do. In the World Cup soccer, under 17, under 19, and so on and so forth, African players always dominate. Why? Because they think that they are under 17 and under 19, but actually they're three or four years older than all the other players. So they have that physical advantage, so they defeat more skillful players from Europe and Latin America. Comes the World Cup for men, they never win because everyone is old. Everyone is a big man. So how was it possible? Any historian would ask that, say that Aisha, no, and she has that correct hadith that I was six when I was engaged to Prophet Muhammad and I was nine when I got married. How did she know that she was six or nine? It's impossible for her to know. No one was recording anything. Evidenced by the fact that we do not know the exact ages of all the companions of Prophet Muhammad Like ask people, how old was Abu Bakr Siddiq when he died? People will tell you 61, 62, 63. Some people say this. Some people, they always margin of error of at least two to three years. The only person around the era of Prophet Muhammad that we know exactly when he was born and exactly when he died and where he's buried and for that matter the only Prophet of God that we know exactly when he was born, when he died and where he's buried, the only Prophet of God is Prophet Muhammad The last Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other than that, there's always that margin of error of two to three years. Most likely, scientifically, overwhelmingly, that she was much older than she was, she thought she was. But having said that, we have the utmost, the best man that ever walked the earth, and the most knowledgeable man that walked the earth about the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the halal haram, telling us that at that point, she fulfilled the two conditions of marriage of girls in Islam. She was physically able to carry a baby and be responsible for a wife, and mentally is she was capable of carrying the responsibility of a family. And subhanAllah, Sayyidah Aisha is the fourth greatest narrator of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Imagine all the men that he knew, Anas ibn Malik, Abu Huraira, SubhanAllah, Umar ibn Khattab, Abi Bakr, she is the fourth greatest narrator of all the hadith of Prophet Muhammad The greatest scholars will tell you that one quarter, 25% of Islamic law of Sharia law is narrated and conveyed to Muslim through a Sayyidah One of the wisest women that ever lived. So when they say, how come he married at nine years old? Most likely she wasn't. And at the time, that was the norm. Nobody ever complained about it. And a lot of people make that mistake. They use the prejudices of their time. For example, uh, girls here get married, you know, 25, 26, that's when she finishes college. And subhanAllah, why is it in Alabama and Texas and rural areas that girls get married that at the early age? It's farmland, rural areas, usually boys and girls get like a lot of responsibilities when they're much younger than anyone else. So the, the character and maturity uh, grows much faster than anyone else. And subhanAllah, in rural areas, uh, there are not that many choices for marriage for men and, 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 and women. So just to have a chance to get married and get married that early is always a chance that nobody wastes because you never know if there's going to be another one to propose. You know, people live in, you know, vast amounts of lands and it's rare that they get together with other people and so on and so forth. And this is a rule in Afghanistan as it is in America as it was in the middle of 7th century. So this is something that, inshallah, we um, uh, want to talk about. Uh, before I want to continue, if there's any questions from the sisters that we want to address before we uh, take much time explaining things, I'd rather answer your questions than, uh, than, than talk. Yes, go ahead. You're not a sister though. Uh, okay. <laughs> But uh, with the, the verse that you mentioned about uh, you know, how like be responsible, you know, for the woman and whatnot. Now, does that also include that he has the the option, I guess, to, you know, have a relationship with her as far as, you know, 
like a sexual relationship with her? Yes, she is exactly a wife. She's exactly treated like a wife. She is linked to his name. If she uh, has a boy or a, a daughter, they are his son and daughter. Exactly like a wife, but without the inheritance rights of a wife, because most of the time they're not Muslim, and they were enemy combatants, and they have the options after that to go and be free and maybe go to another town. I want to add to that also, that Islam did not say, oh, you know, we want to get all the women, let them get married to Muslim men. No, that's not the case. There is an option that, well, if we don't see enough men that are even wanting to take that responsibility, because you'd be responsible for them financially, economically, and so that's a burden, that is not, you know, a good thing. So uh, uh, then they can, if they feel that they're going to be safe, they can let them go if they have relatives or families. The second option, if their families, if they have other relatives and other tribes can come and pay money and you know, release them, so that is expiation for them being enemy for Muslims. And then they have to wait three months, Muddat al istibra So uh, no son of theirs from their old husband, previous husband would be considered a Muslim and so on, so whose, whose son uh, would be known. And after that, then they would be given the responsibility to Muslim men to take care of them and foster them. One of the most beautiful hadith, and actually the, 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 you know, a great hadith as far as the civility of Islamic law, in the middle of the 7th century, in Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith go, مَا كَانَتْ لَهُ جَارِيَةً فَأَدَّبَهَا وَأَحْسَنَتْ وَعَلَّمَهَا وَأَعْتَقَهَا ثُمَّ تَزَوَّجَهَا فَلَهُ أَجْرًا Meaning that you get her, you educate her, so mandated the education of captive women in the middle of the 7th century, let alone Muslim women. This is unheard of. And then you treat her well, and then you set her free, you give her the option to be free, and then you marry her. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him double the reward. SubhanAllah, tremendous civility and mercy and compassion to everyone because it's not her fault. Maybe her husband did not know what Islam is. Like if you ask any American now, all Muslims are crazy people, they're terrorists, and they do that. He does not know. And maybe she didn't know. But now she has the opportunity to be in a Muslim household and learn about Islam and see what Islam is. And maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow His guidance upon her heart, give her the chance, treat her well, treat her mercifully, and then give her the opportunity to get married to a Muslim man. That's the Muslim way, child. Any other questions, inshallah, from the sisters? Um, um, that's a good question. It's asking about inheritance rights for a daughter that maybe she did not get married. And so there's no son or husband to take care of her. Who would be responsible for her? Of course, she gets her own inheritance, number one. And number two, all her brothers are responsible financially for her before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah. Another question. That's a very, you know, sisters are asking clever questions. Uh, it said that what, what if the son uh, uh, is not beautiful and is not doing better to his parents and, um, you know, he's not taking care of them, would he still inherit double what the daughter gets? Let's say they have an opposite case of a daughter that is beautiful and doing better to her parents. Well, this is Islamic law. During the life of the parents, they have the right to distribute their money to them while they're alive as much as they want, provided that they are just. So they support the one who needs more money with more money, and the one who needs less money with less amount of money. That is allowed in Islamic law. But once the parents have passed away, after whatever they choose to distribute while they're alive, then whatever is left, there's no will in it. It has to be 
divided exactly with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this for more protection of daughters. Because if it's up to the likings and up to who likes whom in inheritance, usually people would, you know, take the rights of women easily. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it that there's no will in inheritance. So the rights that have that size for the daughter is always protected and always given to her child. Any other questions? All right, so go ahead. No, not the same amount. No, no. What I meant is the same amount as determined by Islamic law, without the intervention of any will that they left. If they have seven boys, then they get the same. If they have daughters and girls, it has to be divided two and one. But you see, you cannot take one aspect of the law and leave the rest. They would be responsible for the sister till she gets married. And when she gets married, then the husband is responsible for her. Regardless of how highly educated she is, regardless of how much money she has. So that, that, that rule of life. While the parents are alive, they can divide, they can give more. Uh, uh, let's say one of their daughters, while they're alive, they discover that she cannot get pregnant and maybe she's not going to get married for whatever reason. Then they decide, while they're alive, you know what, I want to give you this piece of money that you can have a project to have some income coming from here on top of what you would inherit from the rest of the money. That is allowed. Only condition is to be just and fair and not to love a child more than the other, you know, unfairly. That this is a, a, a big sin also in Islam. Inshallah. Any other questions? Is it haram for a girl to get married knowing she is not able to reproduce? Uh, the fact that she is not able to get pregnant uh, is a major element of marriage. And one of the haram things when consummating a marriage is gharab, is that if you know something wrong uh, with the husband or the wife uh, in the future, and you do not disclose that. As a matter of fact, we all know that backbiting is so haram in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lightened it in the Qur'an as if we're eating the dead flesh of our brother. But allowed only if someone comes and asks me, what about that man marrying my daughter? That if I know something wrong with him, that I know is factual, that I have to speak up and say that because if I keep something that he's a miser or has a disease or there's something wrong uh, with his deen or something wrong with that, then the daughter would actually suffer because of me keeping that fact from the parents. So only in the cases of marriage or the cases of a leader of a country or the case of a boss or a scholar or a certain extent where a lot of people would be devastated and hurt if I kept a certain truth or fact, then I'm allowed to do that. So when it comes to the husband and wife, there have to be full disclosure. It's about trust. It's about honesty. And subhanAllah, uh, some you know people talk about reproduction sometimes. A husband, you know, had two or three kids and his wife passed away. And actually he cannot financially support more kids than that. Then a wife that does not reproduce, a wife that cannot get pregnant, would be a perfect wife for him. Because he already has kids from another marriage. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, puts balances and, 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 and does things, inshallah, for us. We never know what's good for us. Whatever that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides for us, we say alhamdulillah. And we move on, inshallah, and we try to do the miss, the the best with these women, inshallah. Yes, please. I have a question here. Uh, when you know, within American society, there is uh, the relationship between the man and the woman. You know, sometimes it get very casual. So let's yeah. say uh, your your classmates or something like that. Uh, you know, if, if if a girl comes in and approaches you, trying to like to like hug you or something, even if even if like a teacher or something, but again, she's still a female after all. Maybe like some kind of like tricks or something where we can just kind of like stop them without being like rude or something like that. You know, knowing you, what's the culture is. You, you don't be rude, but you have to stop them. And let me tell you, I'm an imam, and in churches, sometimes Christians like the lectures that I give in churches. I finish the lecture and I'm walking down and I see mostly old women. So you don't get me wrong. <laughs> Come running to me, they want to hug me. I like that lecture so much. They want to hug me, and sometimes want to kiss me on the cheek or something. So I, um, I know that, so when people approach me with a higher speed, I'm aware, so I take a step back and I say, I'm sorry, my religion, I cannot shake your hand or anything like that. 
and sometimes they apologize and I just make it easy for them, you know, I say, you know, only pretty ladies. <laughs> just not to make him feel bad, but this is a, a, a very important thing. And inshallah, also I want to speak, and this, I wanted to make this my last point, about the casual relationships and the normal relationships that we have in our American society. It is devastating. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no dating, that is for the protection, A, for the girls, and the protection for the boys, and the protection of everyone else. And subhanAllah, I can give you a myriad of lists about the benefits of that. I want any one of us to imagine that you, God forbid, caught AIDS. SubhanAllah, it will be a crime that you get married while you carry AIDS. Crime. Because you're going to infect your wife or your husband with it. I want us to look at the map of AIDS infections of the entire world. And you look at it and you'd be shocked about one thing that would be poking you in the eye. What is it? There's an area in the world that is spread over the three continents that has statistically no AIDS whatsoever. What, what is that area? Muslim countries. You're going to see everywhere in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe, in every Asia, like devastating. Millions of people have died and hundreds of millions of dollars were lost of lives and cost medication. When you go to Muslim countries, statistically, almost not exist. Why? That is the protection of the traces of when Islamic law was applied that became a tradition of people and people have this purity and have this integrity not to get into that. Who won? Is it the people that have Islamic law and follow and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the people who said, oh, we're free. We have absolute freedom. Freedom to catch AIDS, freedom to get divorced, freedom to get sexually transmitted disease. SubhanAllah, that is the kind of freedom. There was a radio commercial that I'll never forget as long as I live. I was driving and it's, you know, whatever fancy name and what was the commercial about? Please, and that was to American girls, teenagers specifically. <coughs> Please, when you get pregnant and deliver, do not throw the baby in the garbage. Do not throw the baby in the street in the cold till it dies. Bring us the baby, we'll take it, we'll ask you no questions, do not kill the baby. In America, some people heard it. In America, subhanAllah, all over the place, 2010, 2011. That is not because of Islamic dating. These babies are not thrown in the garbage can, human beings, because of Islamic law. That actually because of the violation of Islamic laws. And imagine, subhanAllah, all of us are brought up and how much our parents love us and care for us and they would lose sleep even for the thought that we're going to be hurt. Now, I want to bring to the sisters a statistic that is shocking. But subhanAllah, I want us just to see the dimensions why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, you have to draw a line here, there's no dating. For the protection of none other than the sisters. When you look at statistics about the most probable causes of death, health-wise, and this is a statistic by CNN, and it's not for just one year, for 10 years. Please pay attention to this, especially the sisters. You have statistics that, you know what, the number one cause of death for men over 70 is heart attacks, blood pressure, prostate cancer, women, breast cancer, whatever, you know. There's a statistic about the most probable cause of death for an American pregnant woman for the past 10 years. CNN statistic. What would be the cause? Anyone knows? It's not abortion. It's not AIDS. It's not complication through, you know, uh, uh, you know, when she was delivering the baby. You want to know? In 2012, the most probable cause of death for the liberated, highly educated, pregnant American woman? Here it is. Homicide. She's killed. She's dating a boyfriend with no rights to her, and all of a sudden she gets pregnant. What does that mean? According to American law, 18 years of child support. And he cannot afford to have another relationship. So, what is the solution? So a lot of people kill the mother and kill the baby together. And it's not just one year statistic, it's 10 years. And the second probable cause is a mile away from the amount of death every year because of that. Worse, sometimes it is the husband, he's already married to the woman. 
and she gets pregnant. But you know what? There's another one around the corner in the bar that is willing to date him while he's married. And you know what? He likes this one more. And divorce is so expensive in this country. And now double fit. You're going to give me 18 years of child support? What is the easy way out? Kill his wife and his own son or daughter, the baby. Is that because of Islamic law? Or because of dating and liberating the women out of values, out of the protection of the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Please answer that question for me. One beautiful verse that I always say to people, and I repeat it so often, because subhanAllah, it is a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon ourselves. Open the Quran, Surah Al-A'raf, that's chapter 9, uh, uh, Surah Al-A'raf, uh, verse number 157. Why halal is halal? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with wisdom knows that this is good for you. This will benefit you. Whether you are aware of it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you can see that now or tomorrow because it's good for you, that is why it's halal. Why haram is haram? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is khabit, it is mudar, harm, damage, hurt, long term, short term, for you individually or collectively for your society because it's that damaging, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it's haram. Anything of halal and haram, think about it as absolute wisdom from the creator of heavens and earth to protect you and benefit you. And there's nothing that you have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is purely in no need of anything or any human being and He is the mighty creator of heavens and earth. And what is the continuation, continuation of the verse? And by that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away the shackles, the chains that enslave you to materialistic things, to sexual desires, to money, to stealing, to ego, to showing off, to just be a consumer buying things with no mind, with no spirit, with no wisdom of your own. He liberates you of that when you do only the good things for you <coughs> and with his blessing stay away from whatever that harms you. That is halal and halal. Inshallah. How do we know the Prophet's age if none was re recorded? Uh, the first thing, because Prophet Muhammad was born in one of the major uh, years in the history of Arabia, which is what we call Amul Fil. You know, uh, uh, Mecca before Prophet Muhammad was built by Ibrahim السلام, and many people of the traces of uh, the religion of Abraham, which he was uh, 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 السلام, a prophet of Islam, used to pilgrim, make pilgrimage also to Mecca, which brought a lot of fortunes and a lot of you know traveling money to the community of Mecca. So uh, there was a man called Abraham Ashram in Yemen and said, you know what, why do not I build a building like Mecca in Yemen? and bring all these travels to me and gave that money to Yemen in the state of uh, Mecca. And his way of doing that is not just to build that building, he brought elephants and wanted to march into Mecca and destroy al Kaaba so people can make pilgrimage only to his Kaaba. But that's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought birds that carrying, you know, uh, pieces of you know, almost pure energy that when it dropped on an elephant or an army, it devastated that army and uh, uh, that army was defeated and that was the year that Prophet Muhammad was born in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that incident the mark of the birth of Prophet Muhammad And of course the death of Prophet Muhammad was recorded because one of the major events in Islamic history. So that's how we know when Prophet Muhammad was born. Identical twins here, the same exact question is the next piece of paper. All right, and then we have one here. What if someone is pregnant of rape? An Islamic law is allowed in the cases of incest, like rape, that there will be a, uh, uh, a miscarriage, especially in the first early months, the first uh, three months. Uh, in Islamic law, with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do not become humans, meaning that we have a soul and a human being till the beginning of the fourth month of pregnancy. 
That's why if a, uh, uh, a sakat or a woman have a miscarriage in the very first few weeks, we don't have janaza prayer on the on that uh, uh, fetus uh, in the first three months because it's not a human being yet. But after uh, uh, the, the, the first three months, then it's considered a human being and we have janaza prayer. So in the case of incest, a miss, uh, an, an abortion is, is allowed to happen in general.